Let's pray. Lord, I feel humbled this morning. Firstly, by you, and secondly, by people that you've put in my and Cheryl's life. Just love being part of this church, Lord. And I thank you, I thank you, I thank you that we can be part of this generation that is preparing for the coming of our King. Praise you, Lord. Lord, would you anoint the word this morning. May it be full of life in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, the title this morning is from 2 Corinthians. It's when I am weak, then I am strong. It's a profound statement. And I want to try and open that a little bit, if the Lord will help me with that, to just make some points. I'm, I'm very encouraged by the words that came, even testimonies, Barry, yours, and uh, everything else that happened this morning. Lydia, just so beautiful how this is all lined up. When we are weak, something happens in us that makes us strong. It's, it's a mystery. It confuses the world. It even confuses Christians if you don't dig into it. And I want to bring two portions of Scripture, one from Acts 7 and the other one from 2 Corinthians 12. Just want to draw some truths around those Scriptures. And then there's two points that I'm going for this morning. So are we ready? Turn with me to Acts chapter 7, please. Acts 7, if you've got your Bibles, it'd be great if you could open them. Turn there with me. I like to hear the pages moving. It gives me courage as a preacher. Put that in the next app update. <laughs> That'll be so nice to have an update app that goes shh. <laughs> Why don't you look into that for us, Leon? <laughs> Thanks. Acts 7. This is a fascinating story about Stephen, who's about to die. He's been stoned for his faith and a whole lot of activity around it. Let's read it together. Falling to his knees, Stephen cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. He died. So he died a martyr's death through stoning. Chapter 8, verses 1. And Saul approved of his execution. So Saul, Paul, before he was Paul, he was ruthless in actually killing Christians. And he was there giving approval to Stephen's death. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Persecution brought to scattering, which brought a revival. You see that? The church was scattered through persecution, and the Great Commission, Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. This is the fulfillment of the Great Commission, or of God's instruction, Jesus' instruction, where he says, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. When the power of the Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. He has a fulfillment of that. But persecution brought this on. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice come out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Verse 8, there was much joy in that city. Persecution brought to scattering, which was the fulfillment of, of the Great Commission to go, and the scattering, the devastation around someone's death, brought joy in the city. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Jesus didn't die for nothing. We know that. He died with purpose in mind. And I want to touch on two purposes from both portions of Scripture. The first purpose is this. He died for His message to be taken out. There's something profound when the church catches the heart of going out, of being outward looking, of not existing only for itself, but having this outreach heart. This heart that goes into Goma and goes where, anywhere where the Holy Spirit leads us. And there's the sense of, I have to give what I've got away. This presence of God, this gift of salvation, I want to share it with the world. 
And that's exactly what happened in this Acts 7 and 8 portion is the gospel went out, but it came at a great cost, a great cost. You've heard the saying before, people grow when they go. It's profoundly true. Do you know that Jesus was called an apostle? Apostle simply means someone who goes or the sent one. Jesus in Hebrews 3.1 was called the apostle. Jesus had 12 apostles on his team. They were disciples, but they were also apostles. Interesting that his 12 men, his team, those that he changed the world with were sent ones. He brought them close to send them out. Apostles. We are called to be like apostles. Mark 16, where Jesus says, go, go into all the world. Part of the name of God is go. There's something about this thing of reaching a world for Jesus, which comes at a cost, but it's a great privilege. And the purpose, one of the purposes of Jesus' death was the gospel and the message And the lifestyle of Jesus Christ must go out through the church. I truly live when I give. I'm truly living when I'm giving. Joy comes through a lifestyle of pouring myself out for others. This is the heart and the nature of the gospel. But it sometimes comes through intense difficulties. You know, in in a few weeks ago, um, Cheryl, myself, and Gracie, Craig and Brenda were in Zimbabwe, as many of you know. So, actually, a little longer, I think. And on the, the, the second Sunday we were there, we were at a family's house called Dave and Corin Williams, who lead a church called the Base Church, the one that Ian and Bernie planted many years ago. And on the, on the Saturday night, they had a team from South Africa that came over the borders and settled in the yard of Dave and Corin. And there were these tents that were up everywhere. And I remember there were probably 15 or, or, or 20 of them that came, came at a great cost, 8,500 rand per person to go on that trip. But they were going through Zimbabwe into Mozambique to Tet, the Tet Corridor. They were having an equip there with local pastors. Then into Malawi, some going north, some going down, right down south into the Nsanji villages. And I sat on the Saturday night as these guys came with their tents and rooftop tents everywhere and all sorts of stuff and eating together. And I just thought, oh, this is what we're called to do. I, I remember in my, in my 20s, I did so much of that. Naively taking guys across the border, taking youth across the border, not knowing what I was doing, not even knowing we were going, just like hoping we would get there with the limited amount of resources and knowledge we had. And as I sat and I watched, I thought, God, I want our church to come out here. And I've started a little process, just exploring and and hoping that next year we can send a bunch of teams out. Some to Zim, some to Mozambique, some to Swaziland. There's even a couple that are keen to go to the Netherlands. Maybe you guys have got something to do with that. But there's a few that are are, are wanting to go and do equip over in the Netherlands. And I'm just saying, yes, because something happens when you go. I can't explain it, but there's certain things that happen in the heart of a believer that will not happen in the local church. They happen when you go. When you go, you grow. If you feel God stirring you to go somewhere, you might say, God, eight and a half thousand rand, if I go to Malawi, well, you've got about a year to prepare for it. And I've learned to do this thing. All I want to know is, is God saying yes or no? When, when I've got a decision to make, we were a little while ago invited to a country overseas next year, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not feeling the yes in my heart. But I have to get this question answered. Lord, are you saying yes or no? If it's a yes, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the cost. Why would God say yes and then not provide for you? I'm talking more nations, but even locally, just this heart of going, going to your neighbor, going in business, where you've got this heart of telling people about the gospel. There's something profound when you become a giving and a going people. So that's point one. Purpose one is the purpose is for his message to be taken out. Let's look at the next set of scriptures in 2 Corinthians 
12. This is a very interesting um, set of scriptures. It's where Paul, the very one who said yes to Stephen's dying, stoning, suddenly gets saved, and we know it's a radical salvation. And God grips his heart. And he has such a profound revelation of God that he actually talks about going to the third heaven. The third heaven would be like the supernatural realm. It's beyond natural stuff like this that the eye can see, but it's, it's a, super, a supernatural realm. It's where all the angelic activity happens, even the demonic activity. It's the unseen stuff. It's, it's, it's excuse me, the spiritual realm. And he has this encounter, much like that young girl last night who couldn't stop crying. She had a similar experience where God just did something so rich in her. And, and something like that happened to Paul, but just a little, a little more drastic. And he's trying to describe to us now, he's fumbling over his words. He's trying to describe what he saw and what he experienced, but he doesn't quite know how to do it. And you'll see it's almost clumsy, but it's beautiful clumsy. And this is what he says. He says, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1, this boasting will do no good, but I must go on. I will reluctantly tell about visions and revelations from the Lord. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. Can you see how he's battling to pull this thing together? He had this remarkable experience with God, but he's battling for words which often does happen when, when we have these encounters with God. He says, But I do know that I was caught up to paradise, and I heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Things no human is allowed to tell. That experience is worth boasting about. If I wanted to boast, I, but I won't do it, because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message even though I received such wonderful revelations from God. Verse 8, sorry, second part of verse 7. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Have you ever remembered or put together the fact that this experience of the third heaven that Paul had the result of that was a thorn in his flesh. What was the thorn? We don't really know. There's some speculations that the Bible scholars, as they've dug and they've researched a whole bunch of other things, and actually God keeps it fairly gray. We don't know what his thorn was, but it sounds like it was pretty hectic because he says, yeah, it tormented me. And it came from a messenger of Satan. So God, does God allow Satan to sometimes come against us? Well, it looks like it, because that's exactly what happened here. Did God allow it? Did God, well, no, he did allow it. We know that. Did God make it happen? Did God one day say, I'm going to teach Paul a lesson, so I'm going to make him sick, or I'm going to make whatever, whatever this discomfort is, I'm going to, I'm going to throw it on him? No, he allowed it to happen, but it came from the evil one. The tormentor, which is exactly what Satan does. He allowed it, God allowed it to happen to keep him humble. Because he goes on to say, uh, verse 8, Three times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is sufficient. This is the New Living Translation. It's just easier to understand. But I think it's the NIV that says, my grace is sufficient for you. Lord, take it away. I can't handle this torment. And God says, Paul, my grace is sufficient, boy. You'll be okay. Hang in there. Three times he asked him, my power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and the insults and hardships and persecutions, and trouble that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, that's when I'm strong. This is profound to me. 
It's profound to me for several reasons. Some people look at this and they say, oh, this, this third heaven encounter that Paul had, that's only for the select few, and we can celebrate Yo, we can celebrate that it happened to him, but it'll never happen to me. I read this and I say, if Paul could have those encounters, I want them. Like, bring them on, Lord. Because God is real, and where the presence of God is, like we experienced with these lighties last night, where his presence is, you don't want to leave the room. We live for those moments of these God encounters where heaven touches earth, where God just peaks, he just pulls the the sheets, as it were, out a little bit. The clouds of heaven, he just parts them a little and says, this is what heaven's like. That's what we're going to experience one day. These glorious moments with all the heaven is supernatural. It can't be understood with the mind. It's the spiritual realm where all these amazing things happen. The glory of God is so strong and so rich that there's no casualness in heaven. You know, oh, I'm bored today. Let me just say, you'll never get bored in heaven. When I read this again in preparation for this, I thought, Lord, I admire Paul, but you admire me. And God admires you. And my hand's up for these experiences. Isn't yours? That's how I read this. I'm saying, Lord, if it happened to him, it can happen to me. Because you said greater things will happen to us than what happened even to Jesus. Let alone Paul. Um, this last week I had the great privilege of going with 23 other pastors from around the country to a place called Hole in the Wall. Any of you been to Hole in the Wall in the um, Eastern Cape, Old Trans Sky? Any of you been there? It's beautiful. And we go once a year and we have actually no agenda. We, we eat together. We, um, we don't do a whole lot more other than eat and sleep. But it's very profound. It's actually life-changing because we just spend the morning, the afternoon, and the evening. Guys do what they want. Some go spearfishing, some go fishing, some go hiking, some sleep, some read. But in our interaction together, we're rubbing You're asking how their church is going, how they're doing. And in just the conversing and the playing together and the having fun together, it's profoundly impactful. And Rudolf um, Skitter from CU Nelspruit, him and I drove together to Mayerton and got in the car with a guy called Dave Worley, traveled down and then back again. And on our trip home on Friday evening, we got into this conversation and we were actually talking about children and what God is doing amongst the children. And suddenly the car filled with the fragrance. It smelled like jacaranda. Uh, not Jack Aranda, Jasmine. Jasmine smells, eh? <laughs> smells like Jasmine. And us, <laughs> smells like Jack Aranda. I don't know what Jack Aranda smells like, but I do know what Jasmine smells like. <laughs> and I said to him, do you smell that? He said, yeah. <laughs> Look the window down. It's a smell in the car. And Rudolph says, I wonder if it's God. So I don't know if it was God, and I actually want to tell you because some of you might actually know it, it was coming along the Schumannskloof Road by Jubei and Sun somewhere around there. I don't know whether there's just, it was, it was dark, if I remember correctly. It was dark, so we, we couldn't really see what was around there. Maybe there are a bunch of jasmine trees or shrubs, I don't know. But um, it could have been God. And then a couple minutes later, it came again. And it wasn't like we were having this incredibly spiritual moment. We were just talking about what God's doing with the kids. Now, I, he told me after that, he's smelt the presence of God twice before that. My wife smelt it once before. I've tasted it before, this sweet taste in my mouth in a meeting. Not in a meeting, in a quiet time. I, I don't want to highlight the experience, but I do want to say that those things are real. And whether it was God or not, I'm just grateful that we live this Christian life in a way that God wants to show us what His world is like.
But sometimes those things come at a cost. They come at a price. And Paul talks about this thorn, this amazing revelation that he, that he had of God. And God had to bring something alongside him, and the Bible says to keep him humble, so that he wouldn't boast in himself, but in God. And then he goes on to say, I will boast about my weaknesses. <clears throat> because it seems that he's speaking, Paul's speaking in, from a place of weakness. Strength, but weakness. This tormenting thing that, that came upon him. It, it sounds like that brought a measure of weakness in his life. And in the midst of weakness, he makes these statements. Now I boast about my weakness, so that the power of Christ can work through me. I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in insults and hardships and persecutions. I mean, that's crazy language. <clears throat> I take pleasure in hardship. Can anyone else say that here? It's like hardship, bring it on. I take pleasure in that. It's crazy if you don't see what happens behind hardship, which is what Paul's trying to open up for us here. I take pleasure in that. Why? For when I am weak, the strength of God seems to surge up in me, and that's when I'm strong. Weakness is not a bad thing. Very difficult times, according to this, is not a bad thing. Dipping low, you know, as the Psalms say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's dire. That's desperate. I will fear no evil. Let me ask you guys a question. How many of you, and I'd love you to answer if you're bold enough to, I'll ask you three questions. How many of you have been through very difficult times in your life? Like I think it's just about all of us. How many of you feel like you're in a deep hole now at the moment? How many of you feel that you're in a deep hole now? Some honest people in the room. Thank you. Let me ask you another one. How many of you are in the darkest place of your entire life now? Put your hand up. Thank you. Thank you. A bunch of you. This stuff is real, man. And what's interesting is I, I have been in places where I would be in your shoes now and I would have to put my hand up. Because it's life. Paul's hand was up. Three times I pleaded with God to take this torment away from me. He was tormented. He was feeling low. And we all will go through those moments, different seasons of our lives. When you go through a dip, don't think God's not with you. Sometimes God brings the dip. Sometimes things can only happen in the dip. Sometimes God's, parts of God's character can only be discovered in the intensity of the heat of life. Difficult moments. I've seen that in my own life. There's certain times that I've been desperate. And not a few, by the way. Many times. And I've realized in those times that parts of God's character I'll, I, I only was able to understand when I was in the hole. I wouldn't have understood it outside of the hole. Strength seems to be refined through weakness. Strength seems to be matured through weakness. Certain breakthroughs come through weakness. I almost think that weakness is the seedbed of strength. You've plowed it nicely, and then you throw a whole bunch of seeds. Those seeds will only sprout, in, in, in metaphoric lang language, through hardship, through pain and difficulty. It just puts another take on weakness, doesn't it, and on struggles. It's almost like, Lord, I, I mean, no one wants to go through it, but if that's what you got for me, if that's what's going to cause me to advance in my walk with you, you can do anything. I don't care the cost. I don't care what it costs. 
Grace is discovered abundantly in weakness. Paul says there, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. I know you're crying out for me to take this thing away, but actually my grace will be refined, discovered, highlighted, absorbed, understood, walked in when you're weak. You will discover aspects of my grace that you will only discover in the valley of the shadow of death. Grace just seems to be abundant. I don't know if you've experienced that, but it's like when, when we go through these, these intense, difficult times, it's like grace just seems to be more evident than normal. There's just this thing around you, like this bubble, this clothing of protection, spiritual clothing of peace. In the midst of loss, in the midst of pain, grace seems to be very much available to those of us that take it. I don't know what I'm going to say now. Um, you, you can go and work it through like I'm working it through because I, I feel like it's still being formed in my mind, but I'll let you in. There seems to be a holiness around embracing seasons of brokenness. I'll try and explain that, and I, I, I feel at a loss of words when I try and explain it, but I've seen in my own life, when God's got me in a corner, or when He's refining something in me, when He's rebuking me, when He's disciplining me, when He's challenging me, when He's like any good dad would do with his kid, he's pushing, he's pushing me forward or he's pushing me down so that I can learn some lessons. I've discovered often around those times, there's, I can only describe it as being a holiness. It's like, I hate this thing. I hate what I'm going through. It's so painful. But I feel so close to God. Do you know what I mean? Can anyone relate to that? If you don't agree with it, it doesn't matter because I can't even prove that from Scripture. But I, I think in the light of these Scriptures and others, there's truth around it. There's certain things that we only discover about God when we're in the pit. And it's for that reason that we can say, bring it on. Whatever it takes, Lord. If part of my next season is a season of intense difficulty, battling to get up in the morning sometimes, battling to stay positive, battling in my marriage, battling with my children, battling with my devotions, it just feels like nothing's going right. Finances are all over the show. Battling to get through the month. Battling with confidence. Confidence just hit rock bottom. It's like we find our peace. John Wimber used to say, stand on the mat of peace. And you stand and you, and you just take hold of the, precious, the preciousness around the season. And you dig deep, like George was saying this morning, you dig deep. And you grab from God what he's got for you. And you say, Lord, in the midst of what feels like brokenness, I choose to praise you. I'm not going back. There's nothing there. Where I've come from, I don't want to go back there. It's only advancing. And I embrace the journey, whatever it costs. Amen. Can the team come and help us? I, I want to, um, I feel like God wants to minister to some people this morning. Let's stand together.